Hello and welcome to another episode of The Rest is Entertainment with me, Marina Hyde. And me, Richard Osman. Hey, Marina. How are you, Richard? I'm all right. We're in another new studio yes today. It's, we're doing a tour of many studios aren't but we i think we'll be back on our normal one next week it's quite bijou except it's, the seats are very high so your your feet do not reach the floor your feet always reach the floor My but mine feet. are swinging like a little five-year-old girl <laughs> let us begin with megan's new kind of lifestyle brand we're not quite sure what it is although we do know a bit via the trademark applications it is called American Riviera Orchard, which I love because it sounds like three random words. Yes, or three kids of Chris Martin or Jamie <laughs> Oliver. And so, um, American Riviera. American Riviera Orchard. Orchard. It's a bit like a what three words, isn't it? You know what three words, and it's like oh, that's the SO garage out on the Ring Road. <laughs> it's past Darnell. Yeah, exactly. But if you get to Quick Tie, you've gone too far. <laughs> yeah, honestly, if you put the postcode in, you won't find it. Um, so it's yeah, it's American, American Riviera Orchard. Riviera Orchard. And honestly, it takes you to our front door. Yeah. Right there in Montecito, which is where she is operating out of, as I believe they say in these things, because, as you know, this is the sort of expensive celebrity enclave. She lives in, in uh, California. Now, we've seen an Instagram video of her arranging some flowers, doing some cooking. Keep talking. And the sort of logo. Yeah, I know, you're scintillated. A logo. And so it's quite clear it's going to sell you products because what we do know is that via the trademark application, they've tried to trademark all sorts of things that might retail through this site. Things like jellies, pans, decanters, kitchen linens, luxury kitchen, kitchen lin- linens, oh, kitchen, kitchen linens, linens <laughs> luxury pet accessories. What I would call all the sort of branded homespunnery of late stage capitalism. They will yeah. that all of that will be sold. Just all the important stuff that that our grandparents spent all of their money on. Yes, but she's not the only celebrity with a brand. She and this is actually there's quite a few people who have gone into I I think they used to be called sort of lifestyle portals. Um, and we've talked about ghost-written celebrity books before as a mm. sort of extension of the brand. I know that your wife, Ingrid, is very keen on one particular celebrity brand, which I didn't even actually know existed. Yes, Ava so, Mendes? So, Ava Mendes, who, you know, one of the most glamorous women in the world, incredibly talented actor, married to Ryan Gosling. Uh, and she has her own range of sponges. Kitchen sponges. Kitchen sponges. Yeah, You're probably kitchen. thinking some really expensive, like natural dead sea sponge. No, this is a kitchen sponge. Yeah, a kitchen sponge just for, you know, the sort of stuff that our grandparents did actually yeah. used to use. I'll tell you what, it's $4 though per sponge. And that is, is not... $4 a sponge? That, you see, it's always a luxury brand, even if it's a kitchen sponge. Um, Why is we, it, how, how are they justifying $4 a sponge? Is it is it antibacterial? Obviously, I have genuinely ordered some over the weekend. Because no, you told have you? Me, of course. I mean, yeah. as, a, yeah. as a committed ironist, I yeah. now want to have the product. Yeah. I have paid $4. It's $4 per sponge. I've got a block of these things coming. Wow. Presumably postage is not massive because but, they're very light. They're, they're light as air, Richard, and they're coming from the United States of America. So Ava, Ava Mendes said she was shocked when she discovered that uh, her sponge was the dirtiest thing in her house. What about Ryan Gosling? <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, Ryan Gosling Actually, aside. He's a, very, he's a clean living, clean yeah, guy. Oh, he's a clean, he's, yeah, a, he's a clean living guy. Um, but yeah, so she's done sponges. I mean, essentially they're all desperately trying to walk in the shadow of the great goddess herself, Paltrow. Her Majesty. Right? <laughs> her Majesty <laughs> Gwyneth Paltrow with her with her website Goop, um, which again, a bit like Megan. Megan used to have a blog called The Tig, which was a bit sort of uh, like all of these things. It recommended you how to lay your table, mm. uh, but also was a place for discussion about global issues. I mean, when aren't they? <laughs> and um, Gwyneth Paltrow used to also have a Goop started out as an email, a bit like that, a blog, whatever, and has now become something that's valued at. I think two hundred and fifty million dollars wow. the last time. Yeah, no, it's a lot. I pronounce it go up, like co-op. yeah, go <laughs> go up. But a lot of the celebrity brands are wellness, which I find slightly interesting. First of all, celebrities are a bit of a religion. I do think wellness is one of those words that only really awful people know what it actually means. Mm. You know, like L. Ron Hubbard said, the guy who founded Scientology, if you want to get rich, start a religion. And there's something about religion having gone out of societies yeah. and this kind of weird idea of self care coming in the answer to all of our problems are apparently buying another thing it's a the absolute and i suppose to some extent you know megan for all her woo woo talk about this and that is essentially going to be in retail she's going to try and sell yeah. you some stuff because she's going to say that the answer is buying some more stuff she's like wh smith yeah <laughs> but, but, but operating out of montecito 
I don't know, in the sort of late you know, Middle Ages, the Catholic Church sold indulgences. This is part of the reason why they went ahead with the Reformation. There's something about that word, <laughs> indulgences. Finally, finally but they we're use back all to the Reformation. The, yeah, but I wonder if this sort of wellness culture needs a bit of a Reformation. They're also selling what we might call indulgences. And it, certainly the, the word indulgent is used in all the marketing all the time. And you're sort of being... This idea of self care, but it's it's you're on a journey where you never quite arrive because you you fix one thing and then there's another thing and there's another thing and there's a, but it is a totally atomized journey. This is not something like when you're in a group and you're trying to think about society and how you really make it better. What you're trying to say is your individual purchases will help you and you can buy some more stuff and you can buy this oil and that unguent and that whatever on earth it is, but it's all individualized. There's no sense of the collective at all, and so. When Megan is saying, as Gwyneth Paltrow does to some extent, you know, I'm going to become a talking shop for ideas, you're not really, you're in retail. And I think that that's what a lot of these celebrity brands are. Yes, and it makes them feel better about themselves. Well, that well, that's the thing I always think with celebrities. Say you're an actor and you're very, very well paid and suddenly you're on $10 million a movie, right? And so for the rest of us, we'd be like, well, that's insane. You never have to work again. You yeah. never have to do anything again. Uh, and they're saying, well, I... I do get paid ten million dollars for a movie, but then I then I actually have to make the movie, you know, yeah. and I have to I have to turn up, and I'm like there for six weeks, and there's some CGI stuff, and it gets sometimes I'm in my I'm in my trailer, and I find that boring, uh, and I get ten million, and the next movie they do is just ten million again, and suddenly they're looking at a house in Montecito that's like a hundred and twelve million, and they're thinking I've got to do twelve movies to get this, so the only other thing to do. The way to, instead of making 10 million, to make 100 million is to set up a business. You know, that's the way to do it. Ryan Reynolds did it twice. Ryan Reynolds sold his stake in Mint Mobile for kind of half a billion. He's got a gin brand. And then He's got all aviation sorts of gin. Yeah. Any job you do, you want to be paid a bit more. And if you're an actor in films, it is impossible to be paid a bit more. There isn't another job in the world, unless you're going to be like a <laughs> LeBron James, that pays more. So essentially, you then have to found and own a company and then sell that company. Dr. Dre, there's no way he could have made more money until he put his name to some headphones. And yeah. suddenly they set it for three billion dollars. You're gonna have to sell a lot of records to make three billion. I agree with that, but isn't that also something which we talked about a bit when we were talking about the Beckham documentary and things like that? And that actually the only really thing that really matters is business and then because then you have power. And even if you treat yourself as a business and talk about sort of money a lot in a certain in a very sort of aggressive way, then it sounds like you really know what you're talking about. But I do think there's a thing with celebrities where they feel unless they have a business, they're not taken seriously in the world, that they're regarded as sort of ornamental something or other that we don't really quite understand. Whereas business saying, I've got a boardroom, I've this, we might, you know, we might go to IPO, really makes them feel like they have arrived in the thing that our culture values the absolute most, which is business. But then there's also that thing of they, they do still come from that creative world. And so they there's a bit of them that still thinks business is dirty, which is why they have to go, actually, it's not really sort of a business. It's more, it is a talking shop. Yeah, the it's thing changing that goes, the world. What I actually want to do is uh, raise awareness and enlightenment around the world and stop bullying. To do that, I am going to set up a multi-billion pound business selling dishcloths. Kitchen but, linen. The most, kitchen, kitchen linen, kitchen linen, term. kitchen linen is hard to say, uh, <laughs> and so they're sort of having their cake and eating it, and then selling that cake yeah. uh, as well. I think it's that that's the sticking plaster that says I'm not actually going into this for the billions. I'm going into it because I just think there's a lot of disagreement in the world, and I would like to put that right. I mean, it's a beautiful. But they you know, make you feel you can... worse about yourself. There's a brilliant profile of Gwyneth Paltrow by Taffy Brodus at Acne. Her profile of Gwyneth Paltrow is absolutely amazing. I strongly suggest you seek it out. And she really manages to distill that way that Gwyneth actually sort of makes you feel sort of shit about yourself. And that wellness as an industry does, it makes you feel that you're sick in ways that you only sort of dimly grasp and that the cure is consumerism. And Gwyneth Paltrow, to some extent, makes you sort of feel that you're sick or sick with air quotes around it because, you know, there's some something lacking in your life and then she will sell you the cure. Well, it's, and, it's, yeah, it's like Middle March where, you know, they've got all sorts of potions and powders yeah. for, you know, whatever ague you yeah. have. You go, oh, I need, you know, Dr. Robertson's tablets and Dr. Robertson's pills. And you don't really know if they work because if you're buying one Gwyneth Paltrow product, you're probably taking about eight different products and also your body is healing itself at various times anyway. Yeah. It's like when people go to chiropractors and, that you know, their back just gets better automatically. 
and they go, you have to go to my chiropractor. He is an absolute genius. And it's the same thing. I took, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow's, I don't really know what any of our products are. Uh, Gwyneth there Paltrow's was a candle cream. called This Smells Like My Vagina. Um, ah. there, there's some uh, jade eggs. You put up your f- Her work is strongly vaginal. To there is not the a lot there for me, basket. I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, no, there's not a lot there. There's a, there's a whole other load of stuff for you. But I, what is very interesting, is I read there? there's a really interesting article out there, which is um, that a lot of the stuff... Do you know Alex Jones from Infowars, a kind of horrific yes. person? He's a sort of alt-right kind of fringe wingnut. I'll eat your ass. I will. I will eat your leftist ass like corn on the cob. I'm ready. But you know what? He sells essentially the same products as Gwyneth Paltrow in lots of ways. His, he's got one, e.g. called Brain Force. She's got the <laughs> same supplement that is called Why Am I So Effing Tired? And of course, it's in her a different packaging. But so much of the stuff that they sell are the same things. And, uh, you know, as you say, it's a, like Middlemarch, a cure for what ails you or maybe doesn't. But it's also, it's like Diet Coke and Coke Zero. Yeah. So Alex Jones has sent, it's the same stuff. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Coke Zero is in a black can with black writing. Yeah, and so for the uh, extreme sport yeah. person on, in all I'll say for See, loving life. I, for example, would never, ever buy Diet Coke, no, but Coke Zero, wouldn't. of course I would. Of course you wouldn't. It's for people who think they might one day do a tri- triathlon but haven't done it yet. Oh, I would never do a triathlon. No, that's good. You know, but you know yeah. yourself, Richard. Because I'm allergic to being what... sponsored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always a, it's a, listen, there'll be some triathletes out there, but by and large, it's a cry for help, isn't it? <laughs> this will be incredibly controversial. There'll <laughs> be a lot of emails some, about this. Listen, one. some people love triathlons. I absolutely get it. Some people are triathletes. But it, yeah, by and large, if someone in the office is saying, I'm doing a triathlon, you just go, oh, yeah, well, you just got divorced, didn't you? <laughs> It's this. <laughs> listen, don't at me. It's just a bit. Don't at him. But, uh, and I've obviously yeah. never done the triathlon either. So I oh can't god, really neither. Oh my! But listen, anyone who can do it, I am. I, yeah, I, we take our hats off collectively. I don't we? Respect that we take our the po- hats off. The collective podcast in the transition off. area. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Very good. After the cycle. So there's lots of other uh, brands as well. I was looking through my favourite sort of. Um, slightly mental one Sylvester Stallone has got two very different brands he's got some high protein puddings in a can Great. that he makes a lot of money from but also he, you can buy a, a Sylvester Stallone pen for $48,000 so wow yeah interested does he sell a lot <laughs> Just, we don't need to, does he? No, he doesn't. He yeah. sell two. Yeah, exactly. It's not like sponges. It. Yeah. Um, We're rushing the company up now, but we still made a... But it is, you know, so George Foreman, is, he's made 150 million odd that from, is a good product. From though. the grill. Exactly. But again, that is, I was talking to someone recently about this. There's a lot of celebrities with wines, you know, if you know what I mean, wines without an H. Um, a lot of people who sort of launch their own brand. So the, the biggest selling wine in the UK is, the, is Kylie's, it's Kylie's Rose. Rose. I mean, it's yeah. the biggest selling brand in the country. Yeah. You know, she sells 7 million bottles a year in the UK. So it does incredibly well. I, she seems to be involved somehow in the making of uh, of that wine. Graham Norton sells 15 million bottles a year around the world. Shut the his front wine. door. Yeah, how does about he? that? Yeah, he does. But a, a, Well done, Graham. I didn't know this. But... Yeah, and again, is very closely involved in it. But I, this idea, someone that introduced me, of, of brand slap, which is just someone else has already made something and you can put your name on it, which mm. is what George Foreman did. I think Hulk Hogan was the was originally asked. I don't imagine asked. he was there with the circuitry trying to work out how to do the grill. <laughs> you never know. No, I'd, no disrespect to him. When you are in a career in a show business, and I've always been behind the scenes, so I've always had an actual job, but when you get someone who's just a presenter or something like that, or, you know, eventually they get so bored because it's not, that, <laughs> and what are, what are they going to do for the rest of the week? That's why a lot of um, presenters get very buff. Because hmm. they present one show and then they don't have anything to do for six days, so they go to the gym. Well, that's good. That's what you was like. Footballers, you want them to play golf, then they've got something to do in the afternoon yeah, other than exactly. the things that you don't want them to do. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of them just, you know, they go, on to, I've literally got nothing to do on Wednesday. So if somebody from a sort of wine brand in France says, you know, can we meet Ben Shepherd? Uh, ben goes, yeah, sure, I've got nothing else to do on Wednesday. And then they say, well, why don't we give you £250,000 to put your name on a bottle of wine? You go, yeah, it's okay, I suppose. So, by the way, Ben Shepard is not doing that. No, uh, no, he's and, working and, very hard on the new uh, just this morning yeah, sofa. So. And, it, and if he is doing that now, he, now he's not able to because uh, we preempted it. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that it's a con- these brand thing is a combination of how do I make an unimaginable amount of money, and I'm quite bored on a Thursday. <laughs> should should I take a meeting? Uh, so it, it's um, I mean I don't. I have any... Is it, are you issuing a come and get me, please, at any brand to come and give your... Richard would do brands. The only brand I would like to do... Here's something I would like to do. I, I, I would like to launch a, an alternative to 
celebrations of miniature heroes and Quality Street at Christmas. Like, a, I think there's room for a new chocolate box at Christmas. Oh, yeah. I mean, there that definitely me. is. And a, a crowdsourced one where the rest is entertainment listeners choose what's going to be in the Oh, uh, my gosh. Well, the choose tin. the full makeup. Yes. Oh, I really like that. With Megan, to bring it back to her, and American Riviera Orchard. <laughs> Um, yes, those are the words, and you've yeah. got them in the right order. Yes. But they are so interchangeable. But it's sort of a no-brainer, yeah, in a funny kind of way. Because well, I don't think, it, yes, I don't think no. it's a strictly intellectual <laughs> enterprise, yeah. Because she's got enough people who love her, and as you say, people do need sponges and kitchen linen. And why wouldn't you put your name to something, even if you're calling it a talking shop? Yeah. And what's the markup like on these? But I, I'm, I'm, you can tell I'm coming from, from a, a, a position of weakness here. Well, but presumably you, they're not. Then you are paying for that heavily untarnished yeah. brand, the Sussexes. <laughs> um, I don't know what I don't know what yeah. it will be like. We'll have to see what price point she puts them at. Obviously, Gwyneth Paltrow, it, the stuff is very, very expensive yes. um, by any normal standards. But there was, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow's had nine hundred and sixty dollar loo paper at some at certain points. No but way. But she loves to put that, that stuff better, in. That had better be triple ply. But yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, quadruple. But she she loves to put that stuff in because it gets it's free advertising because everyone says oh my god look what she's done and she just thinks i will monetize those eyeballs she's you know she's monetizing she's monetizing eyeballs now absolutely she'd sell you one no problem in a little sort of gold locket to put around it would ward off something or other because there's a lot of woo-woo she is always using that sort of stuff as advertising um so we'll have to see how kind of turbo capitalist megan gets because you it's quite hard to sort of strike the balance between trying to say that you're about saving the world and doing and also you're in retail. Yeah, and a $50 tea towel. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's wait and see. The Daily Telegraph, which Telegraph newspapers comprises three titles, really. Daily Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph and The Spectator magazine. Um, and they were about to be bought and they were sort of in, it was all in train by something called Redbird AMI, who were uh, essentially a, an investment arm uh, of the UAE, um, specifically Abu Dhabi and Sheikh Mansour. And they've been trying to take it over. But at the sort of last minute, which tells you quite how much those titles, even though we think of newspapers as kind of denuded of a lot of their political clout that they used to have. I don't think in some ways that's the case with The Telegraph because Rishi Sunak has stepped in and the Conservatives are bringing forth an amendment which say that you can't be a foreign a foreign pa- state power and um, own newspapers in our country, which I think is... <laughs> we have obviously sold half of the rest of the country off to foreign state powers, particularly in the Middle East, but it's good that there is going to be a ban on foreign ownership of newspapers. Why is that good, do we think? Well, first of all, it's a sort of monarchical dictatorship, the um, the UAE, and I don't think that people who have obviously zero commitment to free speech and democracy should really have any of, any of those things. I, and I wish that they hadn't been allowed many of those um, repressive autocracies in the Middle East to buy lots and lots of other parts of our country from football clubs to, I don't know, even shops, I suppose, and lots of other things. I think it would have been better if they hadn't. Anyway, We've gone down the river with that. People at The Telegraph are very happy about this because they have not wanted the newspapers and they've mounted a real campaign involving the sort of old grandees, former editors, things like that, saying we don't want it to fall in the hands of a foreign state. And so they'll be happy about this. But the Barclay brothers who used to own it had a sort of £600 million debt, which was going to be covered by Redbird AMI. So you can see that these things are not really that profitable. Maybe they make some profit. They do make some profit. But it's these are not what they are. They are... They are outsized, and the, the, way, the amount we talk about them is because of their influence, and they retain a lot of influence. So it's vanity publishing, essentially. It is in a way. It's not. You're paying. You know, you're, if you wanted to, to put that much that money way. in, you would. You'd really be wanting more return on your investment than what you get from something like this. However, it has always had this big, big stranglehold on the debate within the Conservative Party, the Telegraph titles. It's where people would launch their leadership bids. It's where candidates for the next leadership, which obviously we have a Tory leadership election every 15 minutes these days, where they would think that they would be reaching out to grassroots, all sorts of things like that. So it does say something about how influential those titles still remain, that Sunak has stepped in and done something about it. So we're thinking now, who will buy it? <laughs> Who will buy my newspaper? And so a real sort of rogues gallery of people are coming in. Uh, I mean, they're all rogues. One of the, yeah, Paul Marshall, who's the guy who owns GB News and the Unheard website, he's a hedge funder. People have often thought he would like to get into um, newspapers because obviously, if, and again, GB News, he keeps bankrolling their losses mm. because he thinks it's going to become more important. And as we have discussed previously, I do think it is becoming more important. And if you were able to put it together with 
a pr print titles and di digital business, just that alone, even as it is now, would make him far, far more influential. He was recently described as unfit to own a newspaper. Yes. I mean, God, how wow. low is, is that the lowest bar in the world? <laughs> I mean, God, I've, Richard I've... Desmond's had a few of them. I mean, and, and you know, Murdoch's got loads of them. Yeah. He's obviously, I... Murdoch's in for it as well. Is he? Yes. Now, Mur I think Murdoch, let it go, he can't really. on, well, no, I, well, he can't let it go. I mean, the the rumours are that he's considering a bid for the Spectator part of it. I don't. He can't own the titles. I don't think in competition. The the newspapers on competition. Yeah. So the Spectator probably. is like a magazine that's. I don't think I've ever seen it in a shop. Haven't you? No, it's no. in the shop. It's okay. in the shop, and it's very and it's got very successful um, print subscription. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's it, it does well. The Spectator. So Rupert Murdoch, he sold everything else off, but he's retained the news. He's obviously retained Fox News. He's retained his news titles. Um, we don't know how, quite how front of house he is anymore because Lockton's supposed to have taken over. But, you know, Rupert Murdoch's been engaged twice in the last year alone. He's busy. He's so busy. So he he might want this. Apparently, he's, he's going to buy Tinder. That's, that's, yeah. what, uh, that's what Murdoch should do. He doesn't need to, mate. He doesn't need to. Right. He can't stop getting engaged. I think there is a sense that the Telegraph and those titles are unexploited online. Right. And if you're an English speaking and you work in an English speaking um, country, then you can get, don't just think of America. They think you, you can think of around the world, the Anglophone yeah. world. And that is where a lot of these people are making more money. You can see how well the Mail Online has done in the US. The Guardian has obviously invested massively in the US and it's done very well. New York that. Times is a huge brand now around, I mean, it's pro very, very profitable. Around the world. Yeah. yeah. yeah obviously the the FT, um, which is, so you you take it out of the country's borders where it might have originally been sort of domiciled and you can make a lot of money out of that. So I guess, so I guess the question is, what would Paul Marshall or someone like that, or anyone really, I suppose, want to do with the Telegraph brand in the US? And some people are saying, oh, there's a real gap in the market for the kind of, you know, sensible conservatism uh, that sort of Telegraph readers might like to think themselves part of. And you think, but is there? I, I mean, I'm looking at American yeah. politics and I'm thinking, yeah. Yeah. you know, to break through as a new a, a new brand in that country, I don't think there is such a big... And Paul Marshall says that, oh, that's the sort of conservative I'm interested in. Not necessarily. He was recently found to have liked all sorts of quite extreme tweets. He bankrolled a sort of big conference in London where it was sort of about conservatism, but there were a lot of real wing nuts speaking there. And so I think people think, yeah, your actual politics is not the, the old Argus and Heartland t Telegraph yeah. conservatism that you would have seen in previous years. And maybe if he goes that way, then maybe there is a way to break in and monetize America more because... I honestly don't. I'm not so sure about this gap in the market in American so conservatism. You, so your view would be, if somebody like him wanted to buy it, it would be because there's a market in America for something which is a prestige brand, but was then pushing this slightly more extreme version of right wing politics we currently see, uh, and it would sort of it, it would it would essentially sort of be wearing a uh, a sober suit, but uh, a very garish tie. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good way of putting that. But look at this, the news outlets that have done well with those kind of international Anglophone subscription things. They are legacy outlets. They have managed to build a di digital business one way or another. But a lot of those startups that came and said, no, no, we're not a legacy type, have actually, in the difficult years of the last few years, have fallen away. And so a lot of those big brands are old legacy media things. And it's perfectly possible to say that The Telegraph could do something with that. Closer to home, what does it do why would you want to buy it now when you think, you know, if you're the conservative power broker and you, you know, you politic between the different factions? Mm. Arguably, according to the polls, it's not a great time for the Conservative Party in the UK at the moment. And by all accounts, they are heading for a massive defeat. So you might think, well, why? Why now? In some ways, if you're doing it as a bit of a vanity deal, as we discussed, why not now? You know, yeah. they think they're going to build a new type of conservatism. I have to say with something like GV News, it's sort of amazing. You know, we live in the vibes theory of politics when people say, oh, it's an anti-establishment. Well, how many people from the governing party yeah. 
Sometimes people who were in cabinet or were ministers do you employ yeah, based, as presenters. Yeah, based and filmed in London and bankrolled by a hedge fund yeah, manager. Yeah, and with, with the governing party as, as many of the presenters. I yeah. mean, I'm not saying it's state TV, but it's a lot more state TV than a lot of other types of state TV. And yet they are, because of the vibes theory, they are able, they do have a lot of wing nuts actually as well, but they are able to present themselves as this kind of upstart anti-establishment thing when of course they are staffed in large part by the establishment. Having said that, you can see why if someone who doesn't necessarily mind about money, and we know that Paul Marshall doesn't mind that much mm. about money because of um, because of what we can see he's doing with GB News, you can see why that chance to sort of rebuild conservatism in this country, I have to say probably in more of a culture warrior type way yeah. as we've seen in the um, in the US maybe it makes sense to do it so you don't really care that you're like it's not two bald men fighting over a comb because you're thinking my god I mean the future leader of the Conservative Party everyone's going to lose their seats but maybe that's the best time for them to get in if you don't care about money well it makes it cheaper doesn't it and that's the thing about Paul Marshall so he's a very successful guy hedge fund manager and you know he's become incredibly successful as a hedge fund manager because he understands value and he understands where something's undervalued and he understands how to make a lot of money out of it. So, you know, hedge funds, by and large, are incredibly shark-eyed. Mm. They're, not, they're not there to lose money. You know, they're not there to have something that doesn't have value. As a hedge fund manager, nowhere in a million years he touches GB News. I mean, you wouldn't go anywhere near yeah. it because if you ever do make a, a return, and I, I can't see it, it's not going to be a big return. And hedge funds are all about what's an undervalued industry that I can turn into a into an overvalued industry, and then I sell. So the eighty million that he's put into GB News in the last two years is for a reason. He's buying something. Yeah. Okay, and that's by the way has been done since time immemorial. But he is buying something for eighty million, which is influence yeah. and power, and as you say, trying to push a certain version of the culture war so any article that talks about the profitability of gb news or, or when it heads towards profitability is meaningless in the same way with the telegraph it's a, it doesn't need to be profitable it's not going to be profitable you're going to be saddled with debt but what you are buying is a voice and what you're buying is a voice is more powerful than if you're in say the cabinet you know that's what that's what oh, these yeah. people are doing when they're when, when when they're buying these assets Paul Marshall, by the way, whose son was in Mumford and Sons. Which is not a war crime, but is quite close. The banjo player, I think. Oh my god, okay, war crime. But he started out like um do you remember Liz Truss? <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Remind me, from, but go um, on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she used to be on Corrie. Yeah, Liz uh, Truss from, from politics, yeah. yeah. Uh, he started out as as a Lib Dem, like Liz Truss did. He used to work with Charles Kennedy. So he's been on a long, strange journey yeah. uh, into this uh new world of culture war. But yeah, I think you are correct that I think if there is money to be made it's buying the telegraph and turning it into a clarion of the culture war in the US where the where the name still has some cachet it makes it feel like it has a has... See, I don't know that 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 it, I don't actually think that the name does have cachet in the United States I think it's a nothing to to people in the United States but you could you could sell it as some as something and you could say yeah. it's a legacy thing and you could sell it but I don't think it has anything but if you see how well Mail Online did where, which also was a nothing name exactly because and The Guardian they, was a nothing they, name but it, it had it cost you know. a lot of money yeah. and there were fewer competitors doing it and it yeah. was if you if you decided early as the, the Guardian did to invest in this you were able to kind of go for share quite early and um and people who got into it early now you need to spend more to compete with established players but it, it he's seems, got a lot of money so maybe yeah. he will in a world where they say go woke go broke which doesn't seem to have been the case it seems to cost an enormous amount of money to be on that side of the culture war yes i mean if you want to if you want to put that message out there there's not a receptive audience who are going to pay you for it well that's it what seems... musk's done to some extent they all want to be in a form of news or media or something this is, and he felt perhaps alone among the tech barons. You know, even Bezos has got the Washington Post. They all, at some level, want to have a purchase on media and new and to some something that is at least news media adjacent, mm. as you might say, Twitter X is. And also, by the way, you're allowed to do it. I just think it's worth in the next few years remembering. You know, when you're watching certain TV channels on on both sides of the debate, and you, you know you're reading newspapers, who's funding them? Why are they funding them? How much money are they losing? And then why it is worth them 
losing that money. And I think so long as you look at the media through that lens, then you know you you you, you can't go too far wrong. But you same do old have lens. To, yeah, I mean, it, same old lens. But it's it's been that lens forever, right? But it's you know that's where we are. And so as soon as somebody says, as you say, no, we're we're a scrappy underdog. You think you are not? No one, no one who's been bankrolled for eighty million. Most expensive pounds underdog you've ever seen in the last two years yeah. is a is a scrappy underdog. <laughs> and if it's a scrappy underdog, it'd be like Scrappy Doo, which is like a ruined very, the franchise, yeah, ruined the destroyed franchise, destroyed the, the franchise killer. Oh, can we do a Scrappy Doo? Yeah, we do a, a Scrappy. We do a deep dive three part Scrappy Doo special because. Do you know what? Don't toy with me. Because I would. Oh, I would. Yeah. Oh, I would. You oh, know, I would. I'd, you have to really work hard to cut it down for four parts, but I think it would be tighter. <laughs> Yeah, but, but you know what? We should do Scrappy Doo before the rest is history. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> you think? They'll get in there, those guys, if yeah. I know them. Right. We're going to talk about the 10 highest paid actors in the world last year, which is quite an interesting list, yes. I think. Um, at, the, at the bottom end of it, you've got Denzel Washington, who's number 10. He made $28 million. Do you have to make $28 million to be 10th on this list? I love, by the way, that Denzel is still making huge amounts of money. Well, we're going to come back to that because I've got some things to say on that matter. Not on if Denzel, you... who I... W- no, he will, I will, I'm, it's not about Denzel, yeah, but, but it's about you know the what? principle. But it better not be. Wow, well, let me load up my guns. <laughs> Affleck and Damon both made a good amount of money from air and for various things like that. Statham. Statham. Nearly $50 million last year, which to me feels that makes me feel proud as a Brit that we've got one of our boys up there making films that people actually want to go see. I think he made, he made most I of his money from... He's become frightfully difficult and, and, really? and pleased with himself, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I'd be pleased with myself if I made $50 million Would last year. Would you be year. an absolute nightmare to work Me? Yeah. With? Mm. Oh my God, what, what with that money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. His, his big movie, Fast X, uh, Meg 2 and Expendables, all in one year, it's not bad, is it? No. He works round the clock, which is... Odd, as you say, when you are earning that much money, I think I'd probably just retire and sit on my pool float for a bit. But oh, I don't know. Uh, but the top end of the list is interesting. There's only two women in that top ten, which is interesting. Which is Jennifer Aniston, uh, and we'll talk about where she made her money because I think that's where the interest lies in this list. And Margot Robbie is right up there, not at number one, but at number two. We'll get on to who number one is uh, at the end. But she's number two, acting fees for Barbie, but also producing. And she Barbie. also produced Saltburn. She is becoming quite significant as a producer, her production company. Um, and she, by the way, is not a nightmare to work with. And she's a Fulham fan. Is so she? She is a Fulham fan. So, you know, again, another come and get me plea. Yeah. Um, if she wants to join the board of Fulham, yeah, she would be please. enormously she's, welcome. Yeah. What can't she do? That would be quite cool, wouldn't it? Yeah. Margot, Ro- Margot Robbie owning your yeah. club. Um, so there's some, there's some interesting names on that. There's Ryan Gosling, who we talked about um earlier you know he made somewhere around 60 million dollars and you know you add the sponge money to that and that's uh that is a pretty rich household and his most of that came through uh through barbie as well it's interesting and kind of nice to see that he made slightly less than margot robbie uh on the barbie deal yeah cruise is Obviously. up there when hasn't he been up there one of the few people to ever get 100 million dollars for a movie tom cruise. well i tell you why because Not he anymore. still has something that nobody you can't get this anymore and this used to be a sort of feature of hollywood he has what's called first dollar gross which means that he takes a percentage of the box office and other revenue streams the minute the movie opens he doesn't oh, really? have to wait for his yeah. movies to make a profit which is the way that everyone says and you know you're getting a percentage of the back end and you've got these points on the back end, all this sort of stuff he has Something that is basically unheard. I think he's the only person who still gets first dollar gross. And he, so he starts making money immediately. And the reason that's important is some movies which seem to make a huge amount of money never, never ever declare a profit. So yeah. you can be on part of the back end of, you know, The Matrix and it's made a billion dollars worldwide. But in accounting terms, it's never it's, even broken there's, even. There's a find a way that you won't get paid that, yeah. But Tom Cruise, essentially, if you buy a kind of... Twelve pound ticket to Mission Impossible. He's, he's getting he's immediately getting the quid. It, yeah, yeah. Pick and mix is he on that? Yeah, he's not. He's not in the pick and mix. But he, I, as far as I know, unless he's got a deal with Big Pick and Mix, I don't know. That's what I would do. But number one on this list, DiCaprio's on the list as well. But number one on the list, I think, is very interesting because, as far as I know, didn't have a theatrical movie in the cinemas at all. No, none of these are theatrical. Last year, but made roughly one hundred million dollars. And it is Adam Sandler, the best paid actor in the world. 
Stop looking at me, Swan. What do we make of that? Well, he has a massive deal with Netflix. And I think we've mentioned, if memory serves on the podcast before, what, what they did with Adam Sander, Ted Sarandos, who runs um, Netflix. They looked at what was doing well. And people who once would have gone out and seen Adam Sander comedies in the, the movie theatres, now were at home. They were parents, they had kids. And Adam Sander's stuff was doing unbelievably yeah. on the platform. And they thought... Again, it's a bit like that thing, Billy Bean, Moneyball, at the Oakland Days. They didn't care about like who was a big movie. So I thought, we'll do a deal with this guy. Because yeah. this guy, everybody is watching. And he may not look like a movie star to anyone anymore, but to us, he is. And I think there's something like 500 million... You know that Netflix data um, yes. dump that they did yeah. on the viewership figures? In the first six months of whatever, last year... I think 500 million hours were spent watching Adam Sandler. They just felt like it. <laughs> movies. No, I, by, so by the way, I'm, huge, a, I'm a fan. Yeah, he's hugely, hugely profitable for him. They've already renewed. They renewed on that deal. They said you can never have too much Sandler, I think, um, Ted Sarandos said. He makes a massive amount of money for them. And yet he does not get theat He doesn't. They don't put it on theatrical release. So you do not see his films in cinemas. So that is something that tells you where how power has shifted because the idea that you'd be the number one movie star in the world and you'd, you're not even in movie theatres is quite extraordinary. Another thing I think is quite odd that with probably two exceptions, this list would have been the same, would have looked much the same 20 years ago. Maybe yes. you get Julia Roberts in there and maybe actually next year you will get Julia Roberts. It's That says to me there's something slightly necrotic about a culture that is serving... Movie stardom has never been so old. Can I just tell you, Sandler, 57. Cruz is 61. Matt Damon is 53. Jennifer Aniston is 55. Leonardo DiCaprio, 49. Jason Statham's 56. Is he? Affleck's 51. Denzel's 69. Those are the people who are making the most amount of money. When has Hollywood... It, it, the answer is never. It has never, ever been this old. That is extraordinary. You've got all these new stars. You've got people who are stars and can open a movie. People like Timothy Chalamet, Michael B. Jordan. Um, Margot Robbie. Margot Robbie, obviously. A Fulham. Becoming Paul Mescal. Yeah. But that, that that idea, but there are people even who are movie stars, in my view, someone like Jennifer Lawrence, but when she's not in her franchises... First of all, tell me what a Jennifer Lawrence movie is. Well, yeah. And second of all, that is very hit and miss. She might have a big flop or something that's effectively a flop. If you're in a franchise, the franchise is the star. The IP, the property, whether it's superheroes, whether it's toys, video games, these are the stars. Hollywood has got a problem, I think. If you think that those properties are going to return for you always, the franchises, which as you can see in, in the case of superheroes, there is a law of diminishing returns beginning to be applied. But not having stars or the stars being this ancient, really. I'm sorry yeah. to say, you know, I'm 49, so this is no shade on them. But I don't think movie stardom should be that old. There's something about the young and the beautiful that why aren't they on this list? Yeah, they should be young like the presidential candidates. Yeah, I, I know. mean, to be fair, well, you know, Hollywood stars have usually been about 25 to 30 years younger than the president. And, uh, you know, it, it remains <laughs> the case. <laughs> Um, it's interesting as well, Jennifer Aniston being on there because, you know, that's essentially Netflix money as well. That's murder yeah. mystery, murder mystery too. Yeah. I mean, she makes, she's still With making Sandler, an yeah. awful lot of money from Friends as well. But, made, you know, a lot of her $56 million is from is from streaming. And I quite like the idea, that kind of money ball idea that Adam Sandler's the best paid actor in Hollywood because the most people watch him. Yeah. And for years and years, you get people getting paid kind of 60, 70 million dollars for a movie like Keanu Reeves I think this is the biggest deal ever I think they shot the two Matrix sequels back to back and he was on 156 million dollars for that I don't begrudge him I love him I love him but it feels to me like you could have got him for 120 million yeah you know and suddenly you got 36 million well that was the old way of making deals which as we said is just doesn't really exist anymore and they have so much more such specific data now that they're able to really push for but all of these have got franchises or they've got a piece of IP in the case of Barbie that yeah. is a kind of monster piece or with, of IP. With Damon and Affleck, they again, there's there's a lot of producing there's money. A pr- producer work, yes. Oh, well, actually, come on, Statham. Statham's just there on acting. Yeah, okay, but he's acting in franchises. He's acting in a number of his own franchises. Denzel's got the, that Equalizer franchise that is now is on its sort of third installment. That's what and made does, him most of his money last yeah, year. Yeah, but you don't you don't hear two people talk about the Equalizer in the no. cult, cultural conversation, and yet many people will go out to theaters and watch that, and it's a big, big franchise, but it's not really talked about so much. And again, it's it has a very, very long tail. 
on streaming, yes. which is one of the absolute keys now. Because that's the thing, if you do have something which does open theatrically, and very little does now, there's an extra massive payday when it goes to Apple or goes to Netflix or goes to other people. Quite often, a Netflix or an Apple will have invested in a movie anyway. Yeah. And it will go out, and so they, they then have, you know, first window on... And they're not very it. interested in yeah. theatrical release. Sometimes they just put yeah. it in. If it, they think it might be up for an award, they'll give you try and give you a week or two of theatrical release, and then they'll get it straight yeah. onto the platform. I'll talk probably later in the year about the Thursday Murder Club movie and the negotiations <sighs> that we're talking about at the moment I'm on very similar Fascinating. territory. But it is really, really interesting what you're doing for vanity and what you're doing for yeah. for actual kind of people watching and all of all of that stuff. The era of the, of being paid a hundred million dollars for a movie is sort of over. The only people ever to do that were. Keanu for The Matrix. And that was two films, so really he's only getting 78 million a movie, which is nothing. Um, Cruise, I think, has done it three times. Bruce Willis for The Sixth Sense. Mm. And Will Smith. And they're the only actors ever to get 100 million for a movie. And none of those was particularly recently. So I expect the, yeah, the yeah, terrible, isn't it? The, those poor actors. They, yeah. 100 million Rubbing a movie. Probably on their 25s. Era, yeah. <laughs> uh, is, uh, is over. But it seems to me that you could pay actors, the big name marquee actors, an awful lot less than you do. Well, I think it's become more business minded. And I think that because they have the data, as I say, and you, you don't see people, open, I, I don't think you get those massive fees in the same way yeah. any longer. And people also, there is relatively little choice. They are quite stuck. They have to work. If they want to do interesting films, as it were, I'm not saying that, you know, Marvel films aren't interesting, but I am in a way. So if you're not in a franchise, there's very little that is getting theatrical release. There's very little that you would regard as potentially sort of, I don't know, movies in the sense that we used to understand them, mid-budget movies, that sort of 60 to $100 million mark. There's very little out there. So you're going to have to take a, pay, a paycheck cut if you want to work in that kind of stuff because otherwise, and this is why you see them turning up in all these franchises, even if they're telling themselves it's a cameo, it, you're, you're, you're in a franchise movie. Yeah, and, then, and then there's everything else. And that's why the economics of TV drama really worked, because you're getting the same amount of eyeballs, really, more so than you would have done with a theatrical release. But historically, you're not getting paid £100 million yeah. to do an episode of Succession. Yes. You know, it's TV, people get very well paid, but there was already, you know, there was, there's, there's a limit to what you get paid. So actually the TV business has become much more profitable. But yeah, if I was running a movie studio, and I think, well, I could do a, you know, a 10-part TV series with Sandra Bullock, where I paid her ten million, or I could do a, you know, one two hour film where I'm having to pay her forty million. You know, you'd do the TV one. So that's our nonsense out of the way. Should we do some listener questions? Please and, and allow viewer questions. Let us crowdsource the rest of this show. Okay, well, Mel Thompson's written in. She says, I'm a freelance TV art director, so I've often dealt with props being thrown into rivers. Marina's correct with her info, but now we're more environmentally conscious. A new solution has been found. Water-soluble dummy props. A friend was organising a scene involving a scuffle on a party boat on the Thames and there was concern about the prop gun being dropped into the water. To solve this problem, a prop maker made a replica gun which would dissolve if dropped into the river. I've since used this solution on two shows where mobile phones were scripted to be thrown or dropped into the water. These replicas are strong enough to be handled and can withstand some water, e.g. rain. Wow, I wonder if you could smuggle one onto a plane. Yes. A, soli well, a soluble gun. It's really sad that you've taken something that's really amazing and creative <laughs> and resourceful and just thought about doing a hijack with it. I'm, mm, yeah. That's what I do with everything. Yeah. I had so many other business, but which I won't go into. Jim Watso, thank you ever so much. We, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the Saudi Arabian snooker tournament where they have a golden ball at the end, which means you can get a one six seven break. And he's gone into the physics for me of how hard you would have to hit a ball made of solid gold to make it go into the pocket. It's fascinating wow. stuff, but you know what? Probably not for today. Is it measured in newtons? I've, I've, no, I've, I don't want... You're right. Why am I it's, getting involved? It's certainly but... measured in something. Yeah. Um, shall we get on to today's first yes. question? Uh, this is one for you, I think, Marina. Alex Elliott. Thank you, Alex. He asks, or she, can you explain the difference between based on or this is a true story oh, at the start is, of yes. dramas. Okay. there's And there are many different variations of this now. I recently watched the British film Wicked Little Letters. It's German. And at the start, it says more of this is true than you'd think. And there are many different variations of this, but they are actually doing, in that case, 
it's something that happened in the 1920s and everyone in that was dead. And as I don't know, with maybe our listeners know, you cannot libel the dead. So you can say what you like about someone who is deceased. We were almost going to call the podcast that. Yeah, you, you can't can, libel the you dead. You cannot libel the dead. Yeah, I know. That would be a good one. Um, you but, know what? I'm going to have a good old go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a few things to say about Frank Sinatra. Yes. You honestly can't libel the dead. Can't now, libel the dead, wow. Um, Another thing that's quite interesting and related to this is that no individual holds the legal right to the story of their own life. So as long as you've obtained the um, information lawfully and without any sort of subterfuge, then you are free to make a story about anything. However, as someone who's sort of been involved in various of these things before, you there are competing rights. And the chief one is that you have the right not to have your reputation ruined or to be defamed. That is tricky. So what you'll find dramas which are based on a true story, for instance, ITV's um, Mr Bates versus the Post Office. I remember saying to somebody when they were writing it, have they done all that? Because that's really just quite complicated. And so many of those people had obviously been through the absolute ringer. What they've done is they bought a lot of them up, as we put it. You say, yeah, we've bought them up. You pay right. someone the rights and you will consult with them and say, to, to some degree, writers often will end up doing in a complicated story like that is create a composite character, yeah. someone who serves the purpose of a, a number of different people. Um, so it's not so bitty because real life is much more messy, of course. Now... There are people who are not happy with the ways their stories have been told. I mean, there's an old saying in Hollywood, where there's a hit, there's a writ. That inventing Anna about the fraudster, yeah. the, the Vanity Fair photo editor is has sued Netflix over her portrayal in that, saying that they made her look like a sort of horrible, snobby idiot. The Queen's Gambit, that chess player, is still um, suing Netflix for saying she never faced men within that drama because she felt oh, that actually undermines my achievement. Mm. I face men, I beat men, it should be being included. But they left that out because they thought it made the story better. You don't want to get sued by a chess player. No, you don't want to get sued by yeah. chess And actually that is still ongoing and a judge refused to strike it out. So I think that will happen that case. They have very good defence. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pam and Tommy, the drama about the, their sort of sex tape and their marriage, all they did, those people, was option a 2014 Vanity Fair article about how the sex tape came into the public domain. She, Pamela Anderson, was really upset about that and didn't hated the series um, and made it very clear that she hated the series, but she didn't have any sort of legal recourse. She's doing her own one now. Yeah, but essentially because they option the article then all the kind of legal requirements were, were on the was on the article uh, I don't think I mean in our country as we've talked before about libel in, in this country you would have a lot harder time in the US there's a lot of First Amendment stuff and it's very very dif it's quite difficult to sue yeah. for libel slander whatever she's actually going to make a rival thing about her own story but in general there was something that I was asked to write that and I still really want to write it, actually. The Paul Chuckle story. Uh, I, I, I can't talk about it because it's such a good idea that I don't... Um, I should say it wasn't my idea, oh, but it was it someone is, else's idea. But I felt Chuckle like story. this is the way to do it. But it's only real-life characters in it. And some of them were tabloid journalists, Very a few of them. And I thought, you know, the one thing I can tell you is that those journalists would be the ones to sue. Journalists love to be talked about. They're so thin-skinned. I mean, really genuinely, they would probably be the bigger nightmare than all the people who the drama was actually about who were much more sort of significant. But if you portrayed someone in a way they didn't like and they were a tabloid journalist, in so many cases they would sue. It's absolutely ridiculous, even though they moan about legal all the time. But they, I've never known anyone so, some thin, some thin-skinned as them. But essentially, so that thing at the beginning, based on a true story, or this is a true story, it's, it's sort of a legal disclaimer. Yes. And and the more stark it is, like this is a true story, the more either A, it's about dead people, or B, it's a very accurate reflection of what and happened. And they've probably been brought yeah. up, they've been brought up yeah. by the company because otherwise you are open to a number of different legal actions. Yeah, and this is based on a true story, gives you a little bit of yeah. wiggle room. And quite often they will say certain characters have been invented, certain scenes have been imagined, Yeah, uh, which, you know, as you say normal life is too complicated for an ITV drama by and large you do have to sort of uh, have composites of people we once did a drama about snooker called the rack pack which um <laughs> Sean Pye and Alan Connor wrote about Higgins and Davis and it's brilliant if it, I think it's still on iPlayer and uh Jimmy White was um in it and so as you say they had to go and talk to Jimmy White and say that you're being represented and make sure this was okay uh and they said oh yeah it's um we're doing the bit where in it's in the 1985 Goya Masters, and Jimmy said, "Yeah, I didn't play in the 1985 Goya Masters," and they had to go, "Jimmy, you won it." Uh, so <laughs> it was, but Jimmy White, as you can imagine, was an absolute delight and yeah. was very happy, you know, to sort of uh, give his uh, give, give his say so. But yeah, you have to be very, very careful with 
real people. Yes. Do you not? And they, you know, people do have recourse. Oh, that's nice that they sort of bought up the stories on Mr. Bates. You so really they're making good to, money. You, yeah. You have to buy people like, and really you want to get them on side or at least not get have sort of complete enmity as what happened with Pamela Anderson in that drama. Um, she was, that drama was sort of about how exploited she was by the whole situation. And clearly, if she's out there the whole time saying, I'm being exploited all over again, effectively, she didn't say those exact yeah. words, but. That's sort of what happened. She didn't get paid anything for it. And she feel, feels she was traduced in a number of ways. Then it's not really great for your message of your big drama. No one's listening anymore because they're all thinking, what's the project that uh, <laughs> that you want to do? Uh, well, hopefully it'll come to light one of these days. Is it the Vernon Kay story? It's No, it's not the Vernon Kay story, but I it, that would be worth telling, perhaps. I don't know. Oh, Richard, this is so one for you. Names in show titles. Chris Reed asks, why does Alan Carr have his name in the title of all his shows? Is this a branding thing he's deciding gets negotiated into every show he does? I've also just remembered the full title of House of Games, Richard Osmond's House of Games. Mm. So I'm most definitely not passing judgment here. Uh, thank you, Chris. Again, it's it's sort of like the true story one in, in that it differs in each case. Now, Richard Osmond's House of Games is called Richard Osmond's House of Games because when we registered it, there was a show in Sweden or something called House of Games. So we couldn't call it House of Games. <laughs> so they had to call it Richard Osmond's House of Games. It wasn't an ego thing on my part. But that said, when your name is in the title it's you know that's good for branding and it's in the radio times and people are having to say your name out loud and it is that it, it brings a sort of personalization to it so you know it's it's not unhelpful to have your name in the title it's sort of it, it has some prestige to it with alan carr again his name would be in the title because he he, he often does remakes of other people's shows and you know does lots of great game shows and his name has great recognition he's cachet uh, it's a draw yeah cachet and so he does a show called picture slam now when you're looking at the epg on your television yeah right which is you know the um the electronic program guide so you see what's on and you can usually only see the first three or four words yeah. of a program now if that says picture slam then you scroll past it right because you I think, well, watch I've, that. I've I never i've yeah. never heard of it so you go down to something you've heard of if it says alan carr's picture slam then it essentially says Alan Carr's, well, it would probably say Alan Carr's P, but it would say Alan Carr. So, <laughs> but you see the name Alan Carr, or you think, oh, well, I really like Alan Carr, so I'm going to watch that. Other people have it contractually. Bob Monkhouse it used to have lots yeah. of Bob's Full House and, and uh, all sorts of things like that. And that, I think, is just a branding thing. I think he thought that was a good way to bring everything in-house, and again, people liked him. Lots it's, of the documentary guys have their names in the title, you know, whether it's Ross Kemp on this or that, or yes. um, Danny Dyer. Yeah. You know, they're sort of brand strands in themselves. Brand strands. Brand strands, yeah. sorry. I think I've done a tautology That's there, a but That's a, yeah. you know what I mean. And again, that is because simply because that is the format. There isn't a format other than Ross Kemp going, you yeah. know, to the front line, or Danny Dyer visiting you know football's hardest gangs or you know britain's hardest bouncers so the, 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 their very presence is that format in the game show world i've honestly i've never heard of somebody saying i want this to be called my name and then the name of the show that's not a negotiation i've ever had with anybody or an agent who said we want to do it but it has to be you know Vernon Kay's All Star Family it's Fortunes, a uh, and you know it's just it's just not something that happens. So if it's useful for the show, sometimes they'll they'll, they'll put the name on. As I say in my uh, case with um, Richard Osmond's House of Games, which by the way I never called it ever. Although it's w whenever you get no, it, in it, conversation, that is true to say. I can confirm yeah. you will refer to it as House of Games yeah. rather than saying your own name. Although the the, the acronym, like all TV shows, have acronyms. Like Have I Got News for You? I used to work on was always Hignafy. Would I Lie to You? Was Wilty. Yeah. Uh, and uh, House of Games is Rohog because of Richard Osmond's House of Games, so we always call, we always call it Rohog. Ro Rohog, but yeah, by by and large, it's just it's something useful for the channel to have people's yeah. names in the title. The things that like Dale Winton, who's sadly no longer with us, when he started Supermarket Sweep, and he wasn't particularly known Dale at that time, not at all, uh, and said to all of the contestants, "Would you call me Dale at the end of each of your sentences?" Did he? Yeah. So on that show, a lot of the time they go, "Yes, I'm from Winchester, Dale." or I'd probably spend the money on a new extension, Dale. And it got his name out there so quickly. And it's such a smart thing to do, but that's not necessarily an ego thing because if you're a producer, you want that as well. You're taking a chance on a new presenter who you love because you've seen them you know, do, do the pilots and what have you, but you want that name recognition as well. And so for you, having them say Dale at the end of every sentence is also incredibly useful. Right. So it's one of those things that brings people closer to it. But yeah, I've never... I genuinely, and I'm trying to, I'm honestly trying to think, I cannot think of a single occasion where it's been 
an ego thing that someone says, I'll do it, but it has to have my name on it. You know, so it's, uh, it's, but yeah, House of Games, it was because it was we weren't allowed to call it House of Games. <laughs> okay, good one. Uh, next question on Marina Hyde's The Rest is Entertainment. <laughs> uh, this is from Connor Marlborough. He asked, when shooting on location in terrain such as sand, snow, mud, how do productions deal with footprints left by cast and crew members between takes? Are people on the shoot simply banned from stepping on the untouched ground prior to the first take? So the actors' footprints are the only ones visible in shot. I recently watched Dennis Villeneuve's excellent Dune sequel, which was only slightly marred by the constant thought of how much of a nightmare masking all those footprints must have been. A good question. What do we do about footprints? Normally there would be someone on set, of course, with a broom or a rake and they have to t get it back to normal as best as possible. Like between a golf caddy. Yeah, uh, uh, pretty much. Um, and there are many different surfaces. And some things people have to wear, the blue shoes, you know, the blue overshoes on lots of sets anyway, because lots of sets have got great kind of nice carpets, mm. um, whatever. So most of the crew will wear those shoes. I'm working on something at the moment that's got some one set, which is very beautiful and very shiny and someone is constantly mopping that between each or wow. you know polishing it between each tape so it looks beautiful like the olympic curling yeah yes on something like dune 2 they would have taken a lot of it out in post because you've got quite a lot of money and you can do that with vfx having said that given how spectacular it is and it is incredibly spectacular it's made for 190 million dollars Obviously a huge amount of money, but not compared to what a lot of the big franchise movies may spend another 50% on top of that easily. I've spoken to somebody about this um, and they said, oh, there's lots of software now that even if you're doing your own movies, you can take it out. Yeah. I spoke they, to call a... it, they call it the Kate Middleton suite. <laughs> I spoke to a photographer who was interesting about this, who said, if you're a photographer and you're going out into the desert and do doing things like that, work out as soon as you sort of get out of your vehicle where you're going to be photographing because you're not going to be able to clean it up and make it look as beautiful as it was before. And he said, I've done things like that where I've thought, right, the place I'm standing is the bit that would have looked best in the picture. So you, then it will have footprints. And then I think you can only sort of use it for one of those terrible, trite Instagram captions that says the, no, longest, but the longest journey starts with a simple step and you've got some yeah. footprints in the sand or something like take, that. You know? Take nothing but memories, leave nothing but footprints. Oh, the perfect one, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so that sort of thing. In movies, they do take them out um, and somebody is carefully ra raking between shots, but there will still be disturbance to it and they will probably fix that in post, but it's not the most expensive thing to fix in post. It's one of those extraordinary things about any type of filming is there are people's jobs you would literally not believe. The most extraordinary tiny little things that have to be done all day, every day, whether you're making TV, film or anything. And one of the great things about TV and film is that infinite capacity to take pains, to make something look as real as possible and never take people out yeah. of the story. There are just people whose job, and they're so professional and brilliant at it, is to make everything look perfect at all times, which is why people love it when they're, you know, like a coffee cup is left on Downton yeah. Abbey. Because <laughs> if we just left this randomly, you know, this is how it would be all the time. Uh, and it's amazing the incredible attention to detail that people have. Because there don't... is some dick waving as well on these sort of things. Dick I, waving, yeah, some real. I'm hoping I'm not going to get this one wrong. Henry Cavill, he was a Superman, and he was going to also do a Mission Impossible movie. And because it was Cruise, they were like, "No, you need to have a moustache for this," and no, you can't have a fake one. And so when he went back, and I think it was Batman versus Superman, they had to take out the moustache in every single frame, and it looks. Terrible. Wow. So they CGI'd uh, his moustache. Yeah, even though he was had a out. tiny part in the other movie, they had to CGI it out. And often when you see really bad effects in stuff like Marvel movies, it's because they call it the crunch. They have no time and they've tried to fix everything in post. It's a big part of why VFX labourers are trying to unionise now because it is an absolute nightmare and they're working like 18 hours days and they can't fix everything in post. And it's become the sort of thing like, don't worry, we'll deal with that, we'll yeah. deal with that, we'll deal with that. And in the end, it's like, am I making the whole movie on a computer view at the end? and it's just not possible in the time frames yeah. and these houses VFX houses are completely maxed out and the workers are exhausted and they are all trying to unionise now yeah and that please sweep up your own footsteps yeah can you, can you please at least not tread all over the set <laughs> okay I really like this question from Jonathan Gare I've always wondered if Susie Dent plays along while filming Countdown or does she have a computer to help they always ask Susie if the contestants could have done any better and she always has an answer I, I was in uh, Dictionary Corner recently <gasps> And you know, I've always watched Countdown, and my yeah. grandparents used to watch it. I just remember my granddad sitting there with his pad and pen, and you know, writing down the answers. So I was, I was delighted to go and do it. Um, the way it works is 
the, uh, the producer on that was a guy called um, Damien Eady, who's a former Countdown champion, one of the greatest Countdown champions of all time. One and of the he, greatest career arcs of all time. Yes, exactly. Now runs he, the show. He now, he now runs that entire show. And Susie and Damien are both playing it just like they'd be playing because they happen to be incredibly good at Countdown. Yeah. And obviously I'm playing it as well. And, you I know, don't think you'd be too shabby, if I'm honest. But slight, slightly worse than Susie and a lot worse than Damien Eady. I don't think I ever got to the stage. You can hear Damien in your ear. He always gets the biggest ones because he's just, that's his thing. There's a computer that can back it up if you if you need it. But by and large, Damien is the computer and by and large, huh. Su- Susie would have had it anyway. When you use the computer as if there's a very unusual word in there yeah. that, again, someone like Damien will always get because they know all the words, but a word that needs explaining or a word that Susie wouldn't necessarily have, you know, in, at, at the front of her brain. So she's got a computer for that and she's got an earpiece for, for that. But the fun of making that show, they, they they couldn't have made that show for so long if they're not playing along. No. It's the truth. So Colin is playing along, Susie's playing along, Rachel is playing along. And when you're in Dictionary Corner, you're also playing along. And, you know, sometimes Susie will very kindly write things down for you. Oh. She'll, she'll write down an answer. Susie don't crib. Yeah. I'd quite like she'll that say, for life. This is here or that's here. And I always make it a thing of it. If, if Susie came up with that, I always say, Susie just told me. Sometimes I <laughs> sometimes I watch it and there's people on there who sort of haven't got an answer and they go, yes, uh, I've got a uh, diminoid, which uh, I think Susie, sorry, is um, is that, I think it's something. You think, oh, you, she Great. just so you know she about told you now. that. I, yeah. Um, but yeah, that show, because they've, they've done so many thousands of episodes I think it would drive them mad if they weren't playing yeah. along. I once, and you'd sense that there'd be a real niggle between the audience who would also know that they're doing it and there'd be a real, I think there'd be a foie attention yeah, within exactly. the Countdown studio, which I don't think any of us ever wishes None to of see us wish, and of I, all well, places. I think there's a, a huge, I think that's a very happy crew on that show at the moment. Colin and Rachel and Susie, I think they've, I, th- I think they've got it how, how they like it. Um, I, I recently made the argument, which I stick by, that, Susie Dent is the longest running host on in British television history. People often say, oh, it's Magnus Magnuson or it's yeah. Sue Barker. But it's Susie Dent in terms of the amount of shows she's done. Yeah. And, you know, with Pointless, they always said, oh, I did 2,000 episodes. And I say, well, if I'm a co-host on that, so Susie does so the same Susie, job. Yeah. And so she, she's the longest running host on British television. Cat's Countdown is fun to record as well, but in a very different <laughs> way. Because, you know, first time I went on Cat's Countdown, which is a show um, I used to produce, it's funny, and Joe Wilkinson's mucking about, and everyone's brilliant. But you, a, a bit of you is going, yeah, just get onto the letters because I want to. I've never played the first time I ever did Countdown was Cats Countdown. I was like, I just want to play though. Yeah. So I just let me, yeah. And the numbers, I'm like, it's all very well, Jimmy. You're driving around in a tiny little car <laughs> with uh, with Joe Wilkinson in a sumo suit on your back, <laughs> but I'm really trying to work out this uh, this sum. So just bet. Bear with me, uh, but uh, yeah, D- Dictionary Corner is, uh, is is as lovely as you would imagine it to be. Thank you for lifting the curtain on it and not it not being something hideous behind it. <laughs> oh my! Can you imagine? Yeah. If, if, if yeah, it was an expose, snake, absolute snake pit, yeah. vi- vicious. It, it is, will cut your legs off. It is, yeah. It is annoyingly, genuinely as lovely as it seems. But things, you know, you can see that on screen with shows. I think yeah. sometimes, definitely. I always think on House of Games we have such fun recording it, and that takes away an awful lot of the producing because you can just the very fact of people enjoying themselves really really sees you through and I think there have been eras in Countdown history where they haven't enjoyed it so much I was going to say in a similarly euphemistic way I think there have been eras in Countdown history where they haven't yeah Yeah. a question now from Andrew Shearer he asked I don't think there's an answer to this but I think it would be a very good uh, subject for a PhD he asked read your discussion of social media short clips and dopamine I wanted to ask was you've been framed our gateway drug Oh my God, that's like, I feel like that's a sort of 15,000 word deep dive that I would 100% read. Yeah, it was like YouTube before YouTube, wasn't it? Because it's been going so, I'm going to get this wrong, for three, it will be close to four decades, maybe yeah. say 35 ish years. If I've got that wrong, please write in and tell me that I'm wrong. But I would have thought it's around that mark. And right back at the start of that, by the way, how expensive would video cameras have been? It was quite a sort of thing if you got these things. And a lot, some of them began as, Perhaps TV bloopers from other countries, almost. Yeah, well, all the clips were from America, by yeah. and large. We once, twenty odd years ago, I think we're Channel Five. Um, they they had bought an archive of Russian home video clips and said, "Could we do something with them?" And a lot of them, by the way, oh, you couldn't. Uh, <laughs> but there are a few we did. Yeah, and we we made a show called Lights Camera Accident, 
So uh, essentially, companies started in, in in the 80s, they built up huge libraries of these clips. They would just buy clips and it wouldn't cost them a huge amount. And everyone would go, oh my God, I can make 250 quid yeah. if I sell this. It was, it was 250, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. But someone's th- built this enormous empire off the back and of these And they failed clips. to build YouTube. Why didn't they just build uh, YouTube? And they must have been thinking. If only they had, they would have realised, yeah. yeah. The original producers must have gone, do you know what? We are the cleverest guys <laughs> in the whole world. We're, make, we're making money out of 15 second clips. We, we are making... an hour of... Yeah. ITV content every yeah. week. We're Look making nearly seven or eight grand a week out of these clips. We we are the greatest geniuses. I remember once there was a um, best of you've been framed, and I remember I can't remember who I was talking about. I just said, "Well, that's got to be the best program ever made because you've been framed is the best program ever, and this is the best of the best program ever. That's the best program of all time." But you know, it tends not to win all the Baftas. No. But when Harry Hill used to do it, I used to watch it with my kids when oh. Harry Hill was doing the VO on it as well. He and you is think, peerless. Yeah. They've made a brilliant show even better, but now there's so many millions and millions of clips. And it's funny that that show doesn't really exist anymore because the whole of our culture It's like is that five show. hours of people's day is watching yeah. it's, <laughs> small, it's, short clips it's immediately. Exactly yeah, anything in their, in their pocket. Um, good one. It's a good question. So the say, answer please is... Please can someone point yeah. in the direction of a 15,000 word deep dive on it because I would 100% read... That is all we have time for. But please, will you keep sending in your questions to the rest is entertainment at gmail.com. And if you want to continue on that deep dive down the props, I don't know where this will take us. By the end, we'll be like, okay, we can't have any more props (laughs) questions. But it's very interesting. Yeah. When people wear hats, (laughs) do you have, they do actually, anytime you wear any costume, they take a photo of you, don't they? So they can see exactly the angle of everything. But listen, yes, we'll we'll, we'll get on to that that another time. Oh, continuity. I mean, that's a 15 episode that continuity is fascinating yeah. it, it doesn't sound a bit it actually is we'll, yeah we'll, 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 we'll get onto it we'll do that alongside our, our four part scrappy do series that yeah. we're uh, we're planning to do um, thanks for listening everyone we'll see you next Tuesday we will do bye bye bye